Yolanda has had almost 30 years to cook up a story as to why she did what she did to Selena, and it's dragged out over an almost three hour docu-series that I watched so that you don't have to. And we're gonna talk about it in today's video. What you got there, Mr. Roscoe? Trying to figure out how to crack the box open, how to get into your old Sundays. So y'all, not only has Roscoe gotten possessive over his silver plaque, he's gotten possessive over his box of Sundays when he knows that guests are coming into town. So what is Sundays, you might be asking? Well, it's more than just a cute box. Although we do love the box. It has the cute little crossword puzzle on the back. It has the cute little jokey thing. It looks like a box of cereal. We love it, but we also love what's inside it. Sundays is 100% human grade from start to finish. And y'all, the ingredients are things that we recognize, that we know that we eat ourselves, preferably at every meal, to keep a balanced diet. My favorite thing about Sundays, besides how well it's going over the house, is that it's air dried. If you're new here or if you follow me, then you'll know Roscoe is an elder dog. He's 15 plus. He doesn't have any teeth left at this point. So Sundays has been the perfect texture for him to be able to eat. And then also knowing the high quality that it's made with, it's a game changer. It's vet founded and vet run. The chief veterinarian doctor that founded it was wanting to replicate food just as good as home cooked meals. And so this was their answer. And it's, it shows, you can tell. And again, it's easy to go. The box is cute it's awesome but it also comes with that resellable bag in there you just open up pour it you're done you're good it's good to go personally for me personally for roscoe i should say I mean, he is the one eating it i swear i haven't been nibbling so again with roscoe it's become his little staple to leave out in the bowl while i'm gone to work or doing videos or he's not here or whatever the case may be now also this is why he's trying to guard that little box back there because when i have little doggy friends come over to visit or stay or company or whatever they have i've turned so many people onto this food and roscoe's guarding this this last box with his life. His little cousins are going to be showing up. In fact, I'll put some video footage of their visit after they come into everything. So you can see them eating the food as well too. But he knows that they're on their way here any minute. <laughs> He's not going to let that food get out of his sight. So not only is Sundays an awesome company, they're extra awesome because they're hooking the Sofa Squad up. Okay. They are going to give us 50% off your first order of Sundays. Literally, you have no qualms, no hesitations. You need to try this. Now, what you can do is just use the code SOFA when you go there or use the description that you'll see on the screen. You'll see in the description box, all that fun stuff. Just go on, check it out. Click in SOFA. Go on, claim your fame. Get that discount. Roscoe loves it. And I think your little puppies will love it too. Hello, SOFA squad. And welcome back to the SOFA. SOFA's back there. Roscoe's on it. He's sleeping sound and tight. My name's Paul. I'm sitting in front of it and I'm awake, obviously. Now, what we're going to be doing today is talking about the docu, I call it docu-series, there's only two episodes in it, but they were very long, and that is on Selena and Yolanda, the secrets between them. Now, what this is, is this video particularly, I have my second podcast channel where we do a live chat on these documentaries and stuff like that, and some of them I'll make an edited version and put over here on this channel. So that's what this is. So basically what I do is I watch the documentary, I literally make notes on my phone, I have them sitting right here in front of me, and I just kind of read through them and discuss them along the way. So this is going to be a lot of talking almost more of like a podcasty vibe and less visuals and things of that nature so just know that before you go into it now what i do want to do is do a, like a little overview of everything just to kind of get us on the same page now don't forget also if you want to follow roscoe and i outside of here on youtube we're, we're over on the instagram on the sofa over there on the instant on the gram on the instagram it's on the screen it's in the description give it a follow if you want now let's talk about a quick overview of the case in general so we can all be on the same page as to how we arrived at this video this documentary so march 31st 1995 Selena's life was cut short by Yolanda at a day's end in Corpus Christi, Texas. Now, Selena was on the brink of massive stardom. I remember when this happened and she was already, I mean, she was a star, right? But she was getting ready to catapult, okay? Her songs that she was breaking into like, you know, the American music scene and all this kind of stuff with, I mean, I still listen to them. They're st 
still on my playlist, right? They're major. So she, that's the level she was at of like getting ready to be massive, okay? When Yolanda took her life. Now, Yolanda was a close friend of Selena. She ran her fan club. She ended up working for Selena at her businesses. She had a boutique. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then she was accused of stealing from Selena and, and her businesses. Now, Yolanda tells her story in this documentary. Again, it's called Selena and Yolanda, The Secrets Between Them. She is up for parole, Yolanda, in 2025, March 2025. That's 30 years behind bars. Now, yes, M Yolanda took her life. She doesn't say that she didn't, but essentially she's giving the reasons why and that it was an accident in this documentary. So obviously this is the timing of this. It's about a year before her parole hearing and whatnot. She's clearly hoping to get out. So that's what we're going to do. Now let's go ahead and get into the notes that I made. Now the first episode is called The Woman in the Red Truck. Whether you live through this, or you're just watching this. Again, this is Corpus Christi, Texas, March 31st, 1995. And it starts off the docuseries with a 911 phone call and the person saying that Yolanda shot Selena the day's end. This is the front desk person. Because when this happened, Selena was able to make it to the front desk where she, you know, overcame her injuries, or I'm sorry, did not overcame, where her injuries overcame her, and the front desk is on the phone with them. And, you know, thank God, Selena was able to say Yolanda's name. I mean, she was like, lock the door, she's after me. All of this evidence, which we'll get into in a minute. So, but that's how the docuseries starts off with. And then there's a 911 phone call, or, or more like a negotiation phone call, I should say, is between Yolanda and like a negotiation officer who we'll hear from throughout this. Now, this this ended up being a nine hour standoff after this went off. She sat in the truck with the gun to her head, right? Now she's on the phone sitting here talking about, you know, Selena's dead, my friend's dead, the whole world is gonna be mad at me. You know, there's people that have been trying to take me down and all this kind of bizarre stuff. And it's showing us visuals around the world where people are like having these signs like saying, Hanger the witch. You know, and the negotiation person's like, No, people will understand, you know, they're they're gonna hear your side. He's just trying to get her to put the gun down and come out. You know, but again, nobody liked Yolanda or took her side on any of this. And I would argue that only the few family members in this docuseries are the ones who still do, okay, take her side. So during the negotiation phone call, the cop, the negotiation officer is like, you know, there's always two sides to every story. You know, she's like, my story will never be heard. And then it comes to current time so it's obviously insinuating and here's her story so for me just before we get into it going into it i'm like okay well i i'm curious what her story is what really happened yolanda wink wink you know i want to hear how good this is because look when you set through three hours of it and you get to the final final part and you're like what okay anyways so the hostage negotiator talks, she's in the red truck, she has the gun, she's threatening to unalive herself, the hotel is surrounded. I mean, and this is not by just officers, this is people. I mean, this is major, okay? Like people are figuring out what has gone on. It ain't cute, right? She, there's a major audience here for this. Now the documentary goes into, again, we already spoke to this, but what a mega star she was getting ready to be and already is becoming. The community is devastated by this. Then the father holds a press conference and he says, it was Yolanda that did it and describes her as a disgruntled employee. She was the president of Selena's fan club and had been hired at her stores. And he says that the shooting happened over missing funds. And we'll get more into that later as the docu-series progresses. Now, by 9.30 that night, they talk her out of the truck. They apprehend her. The SWAT team takes her downtown and she meets with a detective. Now, there were only two people in that hotel room, room 158. The reporter says that Yolanda and Selena and all these years, Yolanda has been saying the same thing over and over. It was an accident. I did not mean to kill her. And that's essentially what she's still saying. Then they bring Yolanda in for the interview. And she says that she wants to set the story straight and tell people, you know, like basically the truth. Like, this is what happened. And I'm like, okay, girl, go off, go off. I've got my little coffee cup here. I'm Let's, let's hear it. Now, they'll talk about Chris Perez. This would end up being Selena's husband. He joined the band as a guitarist. They fall in love. They elope. The band gets more and more popular. They're kind of talking talking about the beginning times of this and how just the progression of what, you know, happened. Now, as this is going, Yolanda starts calling all the time, right? She wants to do the fan club. She wants to be part of it. She wants to like, just really get in. She really builds all this up and she gets in and starts becoming the president of the, she becomes the president of the fan club and does, she really builds it up. And they're like, 
okay cool you know so then yolanda starts working with selena's sister at the shows and this really gives yolanda an identity i mean can you imagine think of whoever is like an icon in your mind and you are in on the ground up and you can be their president of the fan club and then get in with their family and start like doing this right i mean it, especially if you've got some kind of like personality disorder going on which we're gonna get to i mean this is major for her now what will happen is yolanda says that selena you she had this aura that attracted you to her and you can see that without even personally knowing selena she had that it factor she was stunning she was talented she just ha it gives me goosebumps she exuded stardom right you can tell she was just a human being that pulled you into her orbit so again that's intoxicating for people especially someone like yolanda who was clearly unhinged okay so yolanda says they become friends and this escalates into where you know yolanda will be like kind of her right hand woman eventually and working at her stores and you know basically being selena's kind of babysitter for the father at times and this type thing so there's that now the documentary will talk about how this situation with what yolanda did to selena it becomes a tabloid frenzy that portrays yolanda as like this jealous spinster because you do see this whole thing of this woman older than selena and all these, oh, we're friends, we're this, we're that. You know, she's an obsessed fan. And there probably was a level of that to that. But I also do truly believe, and I don't know Selena, so I can't say, but just from the way people described it, and this is before she found out Yolanda was ripping her off and all this type of stuff. I'm like, I think Selena would have legitimately been like, no, that's my friend. Like, yes, yeah, she's the president of the fan club, but, but that's my friend. I don't care if she's 30, 40, 50. I just think Selena would have been that type of person now again i don't know her personally but i can also see how it makes for a better tabloid of you know this jealous spinster and maybe on yolanda's side she was right selena probably was just too pure for someone like yolanda if that makes sense anyways so yolanda comes back and she's like i was convicted in the court of public opinion first i'm like yeah, honey you were okay <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm all for go court stuff like that. This kind of stuff, when you pull this type of stuff, there's literally zero excuse for it. And as far as I'm concerned, there still isn't. Like this docu series did not do any of that for me. So for her to even sit here like, I was convicted in public opinion first. Yeah, you were. There's no getting around that you pulled the trigger, right? Okay, so there's that. Anyways, let's keep going. So before we get to this next part, we need to talk about Selena's boutiques. She had these boutiques and that was a major part of her aspirations was fashion and owning these stores and these businesses and really making that take off to me it sounded like she was more interested in that than her music right so this was very big to her so they talked to the former manager of it she's like at this you know warehouse uh, storage place they have all these you know documents and all this type of stuff and she's basically like you know i don't think that yolanda did this on purpose and all this paperwork and all this stuff will prove it now this former boutique manager and all that is a person related to yolanda so there's that she says that you know she's her niece her name is tina she says that yolanda has spent 29 years in jail and will be up for parole in a year so we talked about that she's piecing together all the information because she says that the public deserves to know that there's more to the story than what they've been told okay so keep that in mind as we watch this because again the narrative with all of this is like okay well what's what's the story at least for me right now her family yolanda's family speaks very highly of her they say she's not a monster they know what really happened they say she's a good person yolanda was the first person in their family to get a college education she went into nursing and she said that it was their family that basically started the fan club and one of the ideas of yolanda it was on the idea of yolanda and then they just ran with it made it happen she said that they all kind of helped out in the beginning so this whole thing just kind of took off and again all these people are integrated in with selena and her family and one thing that's heartbreaking about this documentary to watch is like this person in particular tina who and she'll say towards the end she's yeah selena was her friend she knows that her aunt took her life so you're toggled and this is how these crimes victimize so many different people in so many different ways she loves her aunt she loves selena you know i mean it's a very tricky place to be in now yolanda will say that one day selena's father abraham calls her and he's like look selena has to go to la right film this video uh we can't go I want you to go. I want you to be her chaperone. I want you to go be the babysitter, right? And so, you know, she's like, okay. And this is really where her and 
where her Yolanda and Selena's friendship begins, right? This very big closeness that they had. So she goes, she becomes her companion, her confidant. She says that she also protected Selena's secrets even from her own family. This will be a narrative that Yolanda clings to, that she essentially was like the person who was more loyal to Selena than she was to Abraham or anyone else because she worked for Selena. That was her friend. That's where her loyalty was. But that Selena had secrets and that she kept them from everybody and that the family wanted to get to those secrets. So just keep that in mind as we get deeper into it, that this is the kind of narrative that Yolanda takes with this. So Yolanda goes from being the president of, you know, the fan club and whatnot to friends, to helping with the businesses. I mean, just becoming very integrated. Now, at this point, at a certain point, Yolanda claims, and this is what they say, that she resigns from the fan club. And a reporter, this is when the reporter talks about, you know, Selena's real dream was to be a fashion person. It was called Selena, etc. It's a clothing salon, a, a clothing line, almost like a one-stop kind of beauty fashion, like that kind of vibe. It sounded really cool, right? And I thought it was really cool that Selena was really wanting to, you know, make this, you know, happen. So Yolanda will kind of pivot this narrative it says, you know, Abraham told Selena that she's going to have to choose between her singing career or her business. And Selena's like, I can do both. You don't own me. You know, I'm going to kind of be my own person. And Yolanda says that her dad was mad over this, that he was not incorporated into the business. And so this is going to cause friction, and especially when, you know, and if this is all true, you know, that Yolanda is kind of integrated in there with Selena and he's just wanted Selena to focus on the music because clearly the music is like, this is going to be a huge international stardom, right? And so he's probably looking at it like, why are you messing around with this fashion stuff, right? And Selena's over here like, I want to prove myself, you know, or whatever. And I, I applaud her for that. Now, Selena's niece will go back to the original Selena, etc. building. It's very emotional for her and it's very strange. I can imagine where you're walking through this place. I mean, obviously there's another business or whatever in there now, but how it's set up and like, the memories that would flood in. And that's one thing I will say about this docu-series that for me was interesting was just to kind of see some of the places and put them together and revisit that that I didn't get when I was a kid and this happened. So, so her niece says, you know, I feel like by speaking out, speaking my truth, there is going to be backlash. People are going to now associate me with you know, my Aunt Yolanda and what she's done in this docu-series and the whole nine yards because she's been very much like quiet. I mean, I had never even heard of this person right now. People probably in the inner circle was but for the most part of the public she's like I've really probably never even really done an interview over this right so she said that she was really has really rarely ever spoken out most people don't know she's related and that was my first thought too where I was like yeah this is a lot to tag your name to Yolanda should be very thankful for that so the state prosecutor comes in and he takes us back to January 1995 three months before the incident took place and the father starts getting these phone calls from members of the fan club and their people are like hey we're not getting what we order like what's up and at first it, you know it's like well okay what's going on here so the dad eventually goes to Yolanda and he's like you know what's up and she's like these are people just trying to get something for free right they're just you know wanting this or wanting that whatever so he's like you know, okay well maybe so so it keeps happening though a lot and he knows something's up at this point now the prosecutor will come back in and talk at this point and he'll say you know during their searches and all the stuff they did they started finding all these checks at the boutique the yolanda was making out to herself and cashing so red flag material big time these were in like the thousands and thousands of dollars so the family starts talking they're going over this and then they finally basically bring selena at last right when they're like okay here's all this stuff and they said that basically selena was a last Asked to be convinced of this because you can imagine imagine the hurt that would cause you to know that your right hand woman this person you're confident has been ripping you off right imagine how bad that would hurt and how much that would shift your perspective on things so march 9th 1995 the dad holds this infamous meeting right it's the family it's yolanda you know she's laid to it the whole nine yards right so they're pressing her they're like what's going on where's the money what's up now the narrative switches back to yolanda and she's talking about this thing with the uh, fan club and she's like yes when somebody would get something from the fan club they would order it we'd process the order it would send it out but that all went to the person who was in charge of the fan club i wasn't in charge of the fan club at this point you know she's like i was working for selena and her businesses so she's trying to basically say like, you need to go talk to whoever that is is. They don't ever flesh that claim out though. And I think it's just that. I think it's a claim. So then it goes back to this meeting, right? And they're basically like, so they do the fan club thing. And then it's like, okay, well, what are all these checks? They're made to you, written by you, signed by you, 
thousands of dollars in cash. And Selena's sister will say during this part, like during this family meeting, that basically, you know, Yolanda is like acting very nervous and looking over to Selena as like, a, will you help me? And Selena's just kind of over there like, girl, I want to, I want to know too. Now, Yolanda will say during this meeting that the dad is like screaming and yelling and going off and calling her names and that Selena was like, no dad, you know, let her talk, let her talk or we're going to leave and blah, 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 blah and kind of sticking up for her. Now, this basically ends with the dad saying, get off this property. You can never come back here. Well, Yolanda in present time is like, okay, so that's where we're at. But if I was an embezzler, why did the dad never press charges against me for this? They never did. And she says, because there was never any evidence. Now the narrative will switch back to the niece about this. And the niece is like, look, there was no embezzlement or stealing going on because there was no money in the business. Like the business was fledgling, right? Like you were lucky to keep the lights on type thing. Sometimes my thought process is I'm like, I know because your aunt had all the money. <laughs> okay. Is what I'm thinking. But you know, she's like, oftentimes there was zero money in the bank accounts because they didn't have any customers. And Yolanda says that the banks were telling her that the businesses were crumbling, that they were in very bad shape. Also, nobody can really say exactly how much money she allegedly took or where said money ever went. So yes, she was never charged or prosecuted for these. And the prosecutor says the reason why is because it wasn't really necessary. You know, they were like, look, all we had to do was prove like for the, the case against like what she did to Selena was that the father thought there was something going on, which they were able to do. And that this is like causes confrontation and cause basically the bitter employee type thing. So again, you also have to look at it like this. The embezzlement thing versus the charges of what she did Selena. They're going to get her on those charges. Now, they might be wishing they had done the embezzlement thing and stacked them on top, but again, you never know. They had to go with the big charges there, and they had enough to prove that, but it was like, look, we've got her on this, like, clear as day. We're just going to go with this over here. Now, after that March 9th meeting, Yolanda goes and buys a gun, and she says the reason why she bought it was for her own safety. She's afraid for her life, basically, over Abraham and, like, what he's willing to do or have done to her. So after all this, this goes down, she has got all this type of stuff, right? Here's the thing. She still has all this paperwork that Selena needs. And I'm sure she knows this, but it is what it is. We'll get to that. But here's the thing. The state says now Yolanda's whole world is over. She no, no longer has this identity, no longer Selena's side chick. You know, all she would have is to go back to being a nurse in, in San Antonio, and she would never let that happen. So Selena is trying to get these documents. And finally, she's like, look, I, I have to get these. You know, I'm going to go to the police. I'm going to file a lawsuit. What are we going to do? So Yolanda's like, look. I'll come to Corpus Christi, uh, meet me at this day's end. That's what we're going to do. So she calls Yolanda and says, come get them. And Selena goes. So she does this, gets there, calls Selena. Selena comes over. This is when, you know, everything took place. Now we'll get into more of the nuanced timeline breakdown of that. It's not just that simple, but that's, you know, for right now we're going with that. So the shooting, it looks like it happened right over the threshold of the doorway. And what is said, there's some witnesses and whatnot. So there's obviously a gunshot. So when Selena is shot, she runs out of the doorway and somebody will say she kind of turns around, she drops this briefcase and that Yolanda comes out of the door pointing the gun and says, you bitch. Not good, right? So Selena makes it to the front desk. There's a trail of blood that leads there she goes in there and her last words were i've been shot yolanda room 158 so i mean you know it's a no-brainer and they would say that she was like lock the door she's after me who yolanda room 158 and these were her last words thank god she was able to get that out and have that now the narrative will switch back to yolanda and she's like i'm sorry she's gone i'm sorry for her family i'm sorry for everyone i never meant to harm anyone now after the arrest yolanda is taken to the station she gives the written statement saying that yes she's the one who did it now yolanda will say when she gets to that interrogation room that you know the, the, the people are pissed right they had detectives and stuff and basically Basically, she's telling them what happens and they're writing it down and they'd be like, well, no, that's not what happened. It, it went this way and it went that way and blah, 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 blah. She says they kept doing this and kept going over it and over it and just kind of beat her down until she was like, look, okay, I'll just sign this and be done with it. The prosecutor is like, this is what I think happened basically. And you know, whatever went down in that room, nobody's going to know, right? Except for Selena and Yolanda. Obviously, Yolanda's the only one here. But basically that it was like this kind of conversation of you need to let me come back to work. You need to let me do this. And Selena's like, not, no, not only were you not doing that, but we're we're not even friends anymore, right? And I think that the evidence will probably show that, but we'll get into some things that kind of look a little suspicious, but we'll talk about that. 
Now, Yolanda will basically say that, of course, this was an accident and that she pulled the gun out to kind of mimic like taking her own life in front of Selena, maybe to be dramatic, but we'll talk more specifically about it. Now, the state is like, there's never like, she never said the word accident at all. Like, this was never like, this was not a thing, right? When this happened. And basically the state and the negotiator and all these people, they're like, if this was an accident, that she was so careless with this gun that she accidentally you know, shot Selena, why was she able to sit in the red truck with it cocked, ready to go for nine hours and not accidentally take her own life, right? And this is a, a legitimate question. Now, the narrative goes back to Yolanda. And again, she just you know, sticks with this accident thing. The gun went off. It scared both of us. You know, there's no intention. She, Yolanda says there was never any of this, you know, person saying the word bitch and that that didn't happen. And her family members, Yolanda's family members will say that that witness didn't come forward with this information on that day. So slightly, I will give them credit for that because that could have been somebody making that up, but who knows? Although I can completely see Yolanda doing that too. However, it doesn't change my opinion over all of this. So five days after the shooting, a man made us clean out the room and there is an item uh, in the safe and it is a purse and it is Yolanda's purse. There is a letter from an attorney in there to Selena and them. It is a resignation letter to Selena. It's written by her lawyer. So they're like, she was never fired. She herself was trying to put distance between herself and Selena and, and all them. And the niece reads a statement that Selena's husband Chris made and said that Yolanda went to an attorney and he remembers hearing Selena talking to Yolanda on the phone about it and Selena felt betrayed by Yolanda. Yolanda stayed on the payroll but would not come around the boutique. So there's this whole thing thing going on of whatnot. And we'll get to that more with what some people said in it. But again, you can kind of see this all piecing together. It's very messy. It's very, very messy. Yolanda says that no, Selena knew about the letter because she wouldn't accept it from FedEx or there's something with the acceptance from FedEx. She wanted she didn't want to accept the letter. She's like, you're not going to quit. I'm going to lose everything here. She did not want Yolanda to resign, they say. The DA says, nope, never happened. Mm -mm, didn't hand that letter in. Side note, a lot of the stuff that Yolanda says, there is no verifiable proof to it. That letter she could have written and then with no intentions of ever turning it in to make it look like that, right? And then the whole thing, well, she wouldn't accept and all this. So much stuff as only Selena can say. And with cases like this oftentimes that's how it goes so just keep that in mind so the narrative goes back to the niece and the family talking and they say march 11th 1995 yolanda moves out of her apartment they have a tape recorder of her voicemail of her answering machine and there's a message from a job on there it's like a nursing job or something and it's like they're like hey report for orientation this that the other and they're like see she had moved on she wasn't trying to stay with you know selena she had moved on or whatever there's also numerous calls from selena Selena to Yolanda on the voicemail. And they're like, Selena doesn't sound pissed. She doesn't sound any certain way. So there's that. Now, then the question amongst the family is to so them, why buy a gun? What scared her? What was up with that? So one of the negotiation officers recalls that halfway through her standoff, she's talking about, they're after me. They accuse me of this. You know, this with my tires, break, crazy stuff, right? She's talking about Abraham, Selena's father. She says that he slashed her tires and did all this crazy stuff. You Yolanda will say the first time she met Abraham, he was very nice, very businesslike. He trusted her. He confided in her. And she said that there was this constant arguments between Selena and her father about him controlling her time. And Yolanda says, yeah, you know what? I bought the gun because I was afraid of Abraham. That's why I bought it. Now, several people, including a journalist, they'll say, yeah, her father, I'm afraid of him. Like, he's intimidating. And even the pictures that they show are like that. You know who it reminds me of? It's the same vibe you get when you look at, like, Michael and Janet's, Jackson's father. That same kind of just, you know, you know, kind of father figure, stern, mean kind of thing. Like, that's kind of the energy that I got from looking at that. Like, you know, very no nonsense, boom, boom, boom. This is how it goes. Kind of a dude, right? That's going to like run his family. Like, this is, it's my way or the highway type thing. Now, Yolanda says there are two sides to Selena. There's a good side and a bad side, just like all of us. Yolanda says that she had to protect a secret or secrets with Selena. These are secrets that our husband, father, and nobody knew about. Yolanda says that he wanted her to tell these and she was like, I'm not going to betray Selena. My loyalty is to her. So this begins to 
erode like the relationship with her and him and she's viewed as the enemy according to her okay so now it goes to episode two and it's called room 158 the narrative is about how selena was getting ready to be this really global superstar she was you know signing record deals she's getting ready to get her boutique to really explode yolanda was kind of her right hand woman we've already discussed this they're looking at manufacturing in mexico and selena was married so just remember all this that guy named chris so selena is like breaking away from her father that's her manager, her father, very controlling, and he didn't like any of this. So Yolanda's niece says that even though Abraham tried to fire Yolanda on March 9th, Selena and Yolanda continued their friendship and their business relationship, and they have the plane tickets to prove it. And so they, they're going through, they're sitting at this round table, they're pulling tickets out, and they have these plane tickets to Monterey. That's where they were going to move this manufacturing to March 17th. So when they went. So then it's asked, why would she go with Selena if this whole embezzlement thing went down and Yolanda says that Selena was like you can't quit who will run things in Monterey so this is Yolanda's whole thing with this is that she was so integrated into things that Selena still wanted her to be like involved because she was like I, I, I can't do it without you now let's get into that big big secret that uh, Miss Yolanda keeps talking about and his name would be Dr. Ricardo Martinez a plastic surgeon in Monterey Mexico he is basically like a mentor Toward to Selena, and he's introduced as their Mexico investor. But then all of a sudden, like Selena and Yolanda are going to like stay at his places and stuff like this. And so Yolanda's like, mm, but what's up with this? And Yolanda says that Selena and the doctor, you know, they were in love. They were having this affair, right? But the DA says, that's a lie. At trial, even the doctor will say that Yolanda is lying to him and Selena, like they were only friends, right? So he's like, this is a lie. We were only friends. We'll get to that in a minute because I'm not sure who do I believe in this one, but we'll, we'll get to that. So 2012, he does an interview and then he says, everything happened between us was because they were in love and he says that even though it was short we gave ourselves completely to each other so he kind of confirms that yeah there was a little bit of an affair going on I, here's my thing it would not make sense during the time for him to say yeah there was an affair going on because he doesn't want to get tangled up in that mess right of like Ugh. so maybe they really were having this affair and there was this level going on of like you know Yolanda knows about this that kind of a thing right but here nor there it doesn't you know change anything in my opinion so now it's basically like okay so what he's been saying is true so everyone's like okay well if she's a liar but then this is true then what else is she allegedly lying about that's now true Yolanda says that Selena was more interested in the boutique business and obviously with his doctor so anything that she would do to take her time away from this business from the music business her father was like uh, no what are you doing why are you doing this the music business according to Yolanda was like the father's baby right with selena the whole nine yards that was his thing he doesn't want her over here all distracted and again per yolanda so this is when he would go to selena and yolanda be like what is she doing where's going why, why are y'all doing that but and she's like my loyalty is with selena which allegedly does not go over well now yolanda would talk about you know all of a sudden her tires are slashed her brakes are cut there's a, a thing on her windshield that the car repair person says looks like a bullet hole all these things are leading up to this paranoid state of mind with yolanda because remember she's already been confronted about stealing stuff it's like allegedly they're behind the scenes doing this doing that still running this business she's allegedly very afraid of what's going to happen to her then when it comes to those checks, this is the excuse given. So the niece is like, Selena would go to Yolanda and be like, well, look, you need to go write this check and do this and get the cash. And we're going to use that money to go to Monterey to kind of be on the down low about everything. Now, this was obviously to go see the doctor and do this type of stuff. Well, my first thought was, why would a rich plastic surgeon who's allegedly fronting all this money to selena for her business not just pay for her plane ticket like seriously you're gonna have yolanda go and do all this it doesn't make sense at all right i don't believe it so it just doesn't make sense now yolanda will then say like at this meeting that was going on and being confronted about it she didn't want to put selena out there like that so she remained loyal to selena and took the hit for it and i'm talking about that meeting with the father and the family about where are these checks coming from and all this type stuff so this is when soon after this she goes she gets that gun she says i showed selena the gun i was like i'm afraid of your father i felt like i needed to protect myself and selena's like oh, no girl no go return that you do not need that i am going to protect you he will not touch you and they will say leonardo will say i want to return the gun now the state the da will say no she 
100% was planning to do this the day that she came to the hotel and even the day that she got that gun. Then when it comes to this business in Monterey, another person says, yeah, this was all getting ready to really take off in Monterey. They had all this stuff lined up, you know, a, a fashion show, the business, all this type of stuff. And so business was really getting ready to happen there. And no, she couldn't really do it without Yolanda. Now the DA will come up and give a very good example. And he's like, have you ever fired someone or seen someone fired at work where they're going to be let go, but you have to get them to finish a project first before you can truly cut ties with them? That's exactly what was going on here. Yolanda was very invested in this business and they were right on the brink of doing all this stuff. So they needed her to basically finish the job before they got rid of her. Yolanda probably was aware of this and was manipulating that and dragging this out. Now, another one of Yolanda's nieces recounts a time that she made a trip to Mexico with Yolanda and Yolanda's like see this blue car is following me they've been following me everywhere so she talks about this blue car and she felt like it was somebody from Abraham that he was sending these like henchmen out well then when she's asked like well why don't you report it she's like Selena begged me not to it would look negatively on her career and so you know I chose loyalty to her over my better judgment and this is where I'm just like mm, I don't mm, I'm not buying any of this at all at all. <laughs> I'm sorry. So a week before the shooting takes place, remember, Yolanda had returned the gun. She goes back to the same exact gun place and wants to buy the same damn gun back. Now the state will say what really happened is it's not Yolanda's story about, oh, I was getting more nervous with this car. It was she thought Selena was going to take her back in employment. And once it was like, nope, absolutely not. It's done. She went and got the gun again. So you can see the plotting and the planning. Now, Selena is allegedly able to convince Yolanda to go back to Monterey for a third time that month. And this, and this time she takes her sister with her. Now on the way back, Yolanda stops at a Whataburger and she goes in the bathroom and she will claim that two men attack her in the bathroom and that she runs out of the car and gets in there. It's like, we have to leave. We have to leave. I was just attacked. I was just attacked. Now, no one really believes this or they don't. And we'll get a little bit into it in a minute, but later on Yolanda will say that she gets a letter in prison from a dude who is Dr. Martinez is that plastic surgeon's personal chauffeur and says that the attack was ordered by the doctor so then of course it's like well why would the doctor want to get her like what what's going on here and so Yolanda posed a threat to the doctor and Selena's relationship is the theory presented so now this letter is clearly from Monterey, Mexico. There's that, but nobody can actually prove where this letter really came from. Of course, her family, Yolanda's family is looking at it like, here's the letter, it's right here, it says this. But it's like, she's had 29 years to find somebody in Monterey, Mexico to write that to her. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, come on. It makes no sense that the doctor would write that letter and send people out at all. So the narrative of the documentary switches between those days before the killing when Yolanda goes, gets the room a days in. So the narrative switches to kind of like these few days, few hours, that type of stuff before the killing. So remember, Yolanda, she's going to be in this room a days in. Selena's going to come to get all these documents, taxes, stuff like this. And Yolanda's niece is like, look, the state wants you to think that Yolanda lured uh, Selena to the hotel with these documents, but there's way more to it. So Yolanda will say that after this attack of the Whataburger, she's like, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm out. She calls Selena. She's like, girl, come get all your stuff. I am finished. I have all these documents that you need, but I'm done working for you. And so Selena's like, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, I, you have to work for me. Stop at the day's end. I'll be by there later to get them. We'll talk all this type of stuff. So Yolanda drops her sister off at a hotel. Yeah, we're back home and then goes and gets this hotel room. So Selena and her husband, Chris, go by there that night. And this is when Yolanda shows that she's been assaulted. You know, she's like, look, I've been hurt and all this type of stuff. And she's like, I have everything you need here. And there's even stuff in my truck, in the red truck out front. So take all your stuff. I'm done. And that's when Selena's like, look, you're not going to quit on me. And Chris is out in the truck right now. So I'm feeling like this pressure or whatever. So I'm going to come back in the morning. We're going to talk about this. Now, Chris will say that when Selena returns to the truck that evening with this box she's going through it and she's like what what is this stuff like she keeps jerking me around like this is the stuff I, I don't need this this isn't what i need i am just done with this woman 
Now Yolanda will say she didn't even go to the truck to get them. So think of it this way. Think think logically. Yolanda's planning on doing what she's planning on doing. She lures her over here with this stuff. But Chris is with her, so it complicates things. So whatever goes down, she's like, oh no, I probably left this. Come back in the morning or whatever. You know, she's planning on bringing her back, right? So that's what I think really happened. Anyways, so the next morning, Selena goes to the hotel and Yolanda is still on the story about being attacked. So Selena's like, listen, Let's go to the hospital, right? Let's go. So then nurses, people like that were there were like, yeah, you know, she's being like, you know, looked over and she has some old bruises and stuff, but like nothing that matches up with her story. And then basically Selena's over here there in the corner, like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can tell it's all clicking. Like this woman is a pathological liar. So then we get to the question of, so then what happened? What happened in those final moments? How did this gun go off? This is the build up for this whole time. Brace yourselves. So Yolanda will say that when Selena comes in the room, she's putting this guilt on her about, you can't quit. You can't do this. You're leaving me high and dry. You know, blah, 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 blah. You know, and I know you're going to tell everybody about my secret, about my affair, this, that, and the other. And just really going on and making her, making Yolanda feel really crappy. And so Yolanda's like, you know, I was hurt. My emotions were running high. I didn't know what else to do. So she's like, you know, what do you, what does your family want me to do? Do y'all want me to kill myself? And she pulls the gun out and puts it to her head like the motion. And Selena's like, no, 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 don't do that. She starts to turn to go to the door. And Yolanda's like, you know, don't close the door or something to that effect. And she's not really sure what happened. And the gun goes off and this is when it hits, you know, she shoots Selena. And from there, we know what happened. She goes to, you know, Selena runs up front and all this type stuff. And that's it. Okay. Now we're going to get, that's, that's the story. When I watch this and we got to that part of that's the moment, we finally got to the moment of it. I was like, you've had 29 years to cook up a story and she has cooked one up. I'll give her that. You cannot get around the fact that you shot her period. She cannot. And she doesn't. Uh, she's like, yes, I was the one with the gun in my hand, period. I get that. I know that I own it, but I did not intend to. It was an accident. Well, even like the cops are saying how it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense how it happened. And I personally think it's because she's lying, right? None of the story makes sense. And it's just like I said earlier, where, you know, Selena left and came back and did this, that, and the other. It, it's just, it sounds like it, it exactly was what it was. She was mad. She was upset. She, her identity was over with. And if nobody, if she couldn't have Selena, nobody could. And that's what she was going to do. Now, one thing that the family said that I was just like, oh my God, seriously? So her family's like, you know, we're hopeful that she'll get out, you know, in this year. And yeah, but we're also terrified. And they hope that, you know, people understand no matter what happens to Yolanda, you know, it's not going to bring Selena back. And they basically are just like, you know, just let her live out the rest of her life in peace and leave them alone. And I'm like, I'm like, the, the documentary did them dirty by putting them out there like that. Because I'm thinking, what about Selena? You know what I'm saying? Like, this was an idol, a role model to such a, a huge part of the, you know, the community or whatever you want to, the America, Latin America, all, you know, all this stuff. A beacon of hope of like, oh my God, right? I mean, here's this girl, like, literally breaking the glass ceiling and like making her way. And she stole that from Selena and the world. So to now sit here and be like, we hope that people should, will just leave her alone. This is my personal thought. I'm like, she's probably safer in jail. Okay. I don't know how well she'll fare out in public. Okay. This is still, and it's like, this. oh, I'm being in here for political reasons or whatever. It is almost like that because it's like, this is, I mean, come on. Right. I mean, look at who you killed. All that being said, again, my personal opinion, my personal take is that this is all a lie. I'm sure there are some nuances and textures to this that it's like, oh, interesting. Okay. Like I didn't know the back and forth had gone on with Selena showing up and all this type of stuff and the back and forth of the gun and returning and all those things of that nature. I didn't know the, the, how deep Selena was with this business of hers outside of singing. So that part was interesting to me. However, I just felt like Yolanda's re-victimizing her, you know, whether Selena had an affair with the doctor, what 
ain't nobody perfect, right? To sit here and pull all this out, like you had all these secrets on Selena and this and that, it's just like spitting on her grave that you dug and put her in, okay? I do not think for one second that anyone is going to sit here and look at Yolanda with sympathy and feel like, oh, bless her heart, she was afraid. I think they're going to see it for what the evidence shows. You are ripping the family off. They called you out. You couldn't handle it. And so you killed Selena. You know, and I'm sure she does regret it now, right? I have no doubt that she does but clearly there's no level of accountability this is like a master manipulator you know i can't imagine them letting her out you know to sit here and come up with this concocted story to try and alleviate yourself from it when the evidence shows completely otherwise so that's it i'm very curious to know what you think what your thoughts are on it is it worth watching for the reasons that i just stated of oh these little nuances or seeing the building where the thing was you know but as far as Yolanda's story goes, you know, I mean, no. <laughs> It's a bunch of BS as far as I'm concerned. So that's it. Let me know what you think. Little Mr. Roscoe is with us now. He woke up from his nap. He does ask that you drop some blue sofas down in the comment section so that he and I can go meander our way down there and talk about this case and others. And until we do, I'll see y'all soon. I just wanted to say thank you again for watching the whole video. And also thank you for being part of the Sofa Squad. Special thanks to all the Patreon members, channel members from both of my channels, everybody who likes, shares, subscribes, comments in the comment sections. It helps the channel out so much now don't forget i do have that other channel the podcast channel that's where we go live we hang out we talk uh, we have kind of sort of a schedule but just be sure and check it out i'll put it up here on the screen also if you're looking for merch be sure to check out my teespring store i'll put that up here and then like i said in the beginning of the video if you want to follow me and roscoe on the instant on the gram on instagram go on check it out it's right here on the screen again but once again thank you very much i really appreciate you being part of the sofa squad and i'll see you in the next video